I'm sure a lot of people join. Great. Well, hey, it's the uh, second um, Tuesday of the month, so that means it's uh, NAM Tech Shared Conversation time. We have a, uh, a great uh, topic today uh, for you. We're going to be talking about open education uh, and open uh, media resources. Uh, I know a lot of uh, ESAs as well as school districts are looking at leveraging this content uh, that's free. We're so glad that uh, you, know, you were able to take some time out of your busy schedule to um, to participate uh, in this. Uh, my name is Jeff Craven. I'm the Executive Director of NAMTEC, uh, which is the National Association of Media and Technology Centers. Um, uh, today with us, we, we have uh, Dr. Brad Bradley Landis from the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit, who has graciously uh, has uh, offered to uh, uh, share his time and his expertise on this important topic. And we also have uh, help sponsoring today's uh, shared conversation. We also have Igor Bushkin, who uh, is with Mindshine, Te Mindshine Technologies, who will also talk briefly about uh, some of the work that they're doing uh, with the Iowa AEAs in a, a portal to help manage uh, this content. Um, so again, with that, oh, just a quick plug uh, for Namtech. Um, if you're not a member, we certainly would love to have you. Uh, it's namtech.org. And also our Leadership Summit, Reach All, Teach All, Every Day in a Personalized Way. Uh, will be held the week after Thanksgiving, that, that Tuesday and uh, Wednesday, week after Thanksgiving in San Antonio Hill Country, um, in San Antonio, Texas, in, uh, uh, again, in November. So love to see you there as well. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to Brad to let him introduce himself, and uh, then we'll also turn it over to Igor, and then we'll let Brad take over. Okay. Uh, did you want to just introduce and then – Igor will introduce, and then we'll start the session. Is that how you want to work? Sure, that'll be fine. That'll be great. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Brad Landis. I'm um, the Assistant Executive Director at Montgomery County Intermediate Unit in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania has 29 intermediate units spread out across the Commonwealth supporting school districts. In the east, they tend to be one per county. In central and western part of the state, uh, one IU might have a broader geographic space than that. And so um, we've been um, at, at our intermediate unit trying to get our heads around OER. We know it's, um, it, it is going to be a big factor in how schools work uh, in the next five to or so years and moving beyond that. And so we're trying to get our heads around what it is, um, how it can best be utilized in, in school settings and what we can do to support our member districts and member schools trying to uh, implement that. So that's the genesis of uh, my involvement with this topic. All right. Do you, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Certainly. Um, uh, so uh, my name is Igor Babushkin, and uh, I'm uh, one of the partners in a company called Mindshine. And uh, uh, Mindshine uh, is kind of a long-term passion of mine, in a way. Um, it started uh, about 16 years ago, uh, actually 17 years ago now, um, working with school districts and uh, educational organizations around the country. So what Mindshine does, uh, we help um, educators to build their ideas into software products that they can use. Uh, we work with um, educational agencies, um, we work with software vendors, and we work with school districts directly, uh, trying to build some better tools, better things uh, to help kids uh, to learn um, and do things better. So uh, with that being said, um, we do work with um, uh, Iowa AAs um, right now on the project, um, which I'm sure I will we'll cover a bit later, um, uh, that... Uh, does integrate digital media uh, content uh, that comes from different sources into one singular place so that people can experience it in a uniform fashion. So that's how we uh, kind of touch uh, some portion, I guess, of OER content, which is a bigger, uh, it, which is a part of that vision for that portal. So, um, and that's what we do. Okay, thanks, Igor. Um, with that, I just want to turn it over to Brad and uh, start the presentation. Uh, again, if, if you have never participated in a shared conversation, feel free to you know, text your questions 
Um, or, you know, if you have anything to contribute, you'd like to ask any questions, you know, feel free to, you know, um, you know, to, to jump in or, um, you know, of course, I'll let the, the Brad Elry wants to handle the, uh, uh, that discussion and questions and so forth. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brad. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I haven't sat through a full shared conversation before. So what, what time frame are we looking at as far as length? Uh, normally, we try to wrap everything up within an hour. Okay, um, so that's what, kind of what I thought was yeah. going to happen. Um, as I mentioned in, in, in my introduction, uh, we are just um, trying to collect information on, on OER and, and figure, navigate our way through uh, what it is and how we can support our districts and schools that are, that are using it. I'm curious, uh, the people that are sitting in today, on a scale of one to five, uh, with your knowledge of OER, and that landscape with a five being the highest and one being just learning about it. Uh, could you uh, put in the, the chat where you think you are? So I have a sense of what, what I'm dealing with and maybe I'll turn this presentation over to someone else that is higher than my two. Okay. So we have, uh, from one to uh, up to three or four, and uh, great. So as this is a conversation, so uh, feel free to uh, to jump in and, and offer things that uh, I might have overlooked or that I'm not as strong and comfortable with as, as you might be. Um, so with with the uh, the orientation of of where where we think we are. Right, type in one, one or two words that come to mind when you hear the term OER. I'd like to see what folks are thinking. <laughs> Three. That's good. <laughs> Vibration. All right, so we have collaboration, text-based, free resources that support curriculum, a way to share, editable, use a portion of it, free like a puppy. So those are, those are excellent, and they all sort of tie in with my understanding and, and the kinds of things that I'd like to share with you here today. Uh, Jeff, is it possible that I can uh, share my screen? Sure. Uh, Angela, can you set him up to share the screen, please? It, it says screen share here, so I guess I, I can just go ahead. It's yeah, all right. Screen, I think you can just share it. Yes, just go right ahead and you can share. Okay, great. Are you seeing the beginning of a PowerPoint? Not yet. Not yet, Brad. You may want to click the start button after you select it. Okay, share screen. Yep, there we go. Is that better? Yep, perfect. Okay. So we've gone through uh, your one word and uh, we got some good uh, ideas in the chat box. So what I hope to accomplish today is just a, an overview of OER and how they can be used in schools. And any understanding of OER requires some understanding of, of Creative Commons licenses. Uh, touch briefly on the Go Open movement uh, at the national level and moving into the various states. Uh, identify tools and resources for finding and vetting OER. And, um, I think Igor can help with some other possibilities that he's come across, I'm sure. And then discuss um, OER Commons and in and, and our case, how intermediate units can support their schools in integrating OER, but you know, regional service agencies in, in general across the country. And there are a number of states that are already part of OER Commons, and it's a discussion that's happening in Pennsylvania right now as well. So the easy definition of, of OER I have there on the screen for you, and I have these slides. Uh, I put
put a number of files into this shared uh, folder on Google that you should have access to so you can get these uh, when you have time or interest. So it is uh, teaching and learning and resort research resources that are in the public domain and have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and also repurposing by others. Uh, and it can be all the way from full courses uh, to modules to something as small as a single photograph or a sound file and, and other tools and materials. So anything that supports um, curriculum and instruction. They exist in many formats and which gives students and, and teachers and planners the opportunity to mix and match and individualize uh, based on the needs of the, the students that are uh, they're working with. There are also many sources out there that uh, are places that you can go to harvest OER resources to work and depending on what you're after whether it's a sound file or a photograph to full uh, curriculum k-12 in, in some state repositories uh, and anything in between from Khan Academy to fish tree to OER Commons and Google is a great source as well for finding OER resources And you know this question why OERs has been discussed uh, in many venues over the last many years and uh, some of the reasons that are cited most often are uh, it can support universal design for learning basically when you start from scratch and build something you can adapt it for the the audience and the individuals that you are working with um, if you keep current with with your uh, materials and, and, and uh, resources that you use in your programs, it should be current and relevant. It's not out of date the minute it's shipped uh, in a print format, um, like many textbooks are. Uh, interactive and engaging resources, there are options out there. There's, there's a lot of non-interactive and non-engaging resources, but if you have a good process for vetting and uh, identifying the resources that then you should be able to find many many opportunities to have high quality and engaging resources uh, the ability to personalize adapt instructional resources uh, someone mentioned in the opening the collaboration and connecting uh, and that this is something that's very easy to do uh, in the OER world connecting globally with teachers around the world uh, like other digital resources, uh, it can be anytime, anywhere learning. And there's often a debate over cost savings because uh, some see OER as a way to eliminate the need for textbooks and other curriculum materials that have recurring annual fees and licensing uh, software. Uh, but when you try and factor in building something from the ground up, with the expertise uh, required to do that from curriculum experts and, and lead teachers and so forth, there is a good amount of time involved and then the vetting and then the implementation and then the evaluation of how well things have gone and are going and then you know adapting to, to meet what you find in your assessment, there is a debate whether there is a great cost savings there. But I'm curious of, of some other ideas of why OERs might be useful and, and we should be pursuing our understanding and, and ability to, to utilize that. I would open it up to anyone on the, on the Zoom here. The, can I add something to this? Sure. Well, um, in my mind, uh, the advantage of the OER is that it allows for a great degree of personalization of content uh, when it's brought into the classroom. Um, I, my, my first experience with us was uh, in 2000 and probably two. Uh, we had a product called uh, Teacher Pages, which allowed uh, teachers to post their content online. And there was one teacher, uh, she was a chemistry teacher in the high school. Um, she ultimately developed uh, the whole course uh, that led the 
uh, chemistry course. She said that that was the course that was much better written than uh, the textbooks and the materials available at the time uh, by the commercial vendors. Um, so she just spent her time. She was it was actually quite an uh, amazing amount of work that she put in this, uh, and she just wanted to make sure that her students could see this online. Uh, uh, you know, and so. Uh, the idea was that uh, sh she had a specific way to, uh, to teach her course that she wanted to customize the curriculum and she had no other way to do it other than creating her own course. So with I OER, what you can do is uh, you can uh, allow other teachers to contribute and, and change the content based on the way they teach things. Um, so which makes uh, the personalization is very big aspect of this uh, as, as educators uh, learn through through the time really there is no one silver bullet that fits all students um, likewise you know there is no one set of content that's just perfect um, so it, it fits different people differently and uh, OER ultimately gives teachers more control over how it's presented and what needs to be changed on um, as they see uh, situations in their classrooms. So that's, I think, one of the beauty uh, uh, or a very big beauty of the OER content itself. So. Right, and I think that's a good strategy for a school or a district that is new to OER to get into it. Start where you have something that you want, wish was better, and in that case it was a chemistry course, and it's not that one day you are not OER at all, you're all textbook based, and then the next fall you wake up and you're OER. So right, the implementation right. is, a, is, is a challenge, and one way to do it is course by course, starting with the one that has the greatest opportunity for improvement. Yep. Okay, and just a, a brief clarification of sometimes people think of open and free as synonymous, and it's not really the case. Uh, OER will always be free in digital form, but not all free resources are OER. There's some that have licenses that might be restricted or may prevent you from adapting or making changes, and, and those would not be considered OER. And uh, are all OER Digital, I would say most of the OER that is in um, being shared and adaptive is digital in nature, but OER is available uh, in printed formats for distribution as well. Obviously, it's easier to share and modify and redistribute digital. And how, how does one know if an educational resource is, is an OER? And I guess the, the, the key is whether or not beyond its copyright, whether it's tagged or marked as having an open license and it is able to be shared and adapted and repurposed and that typically that distinguishes OER from free. And you can have custom copyright licenses for things that you develop, uh, which can be a little bit complicated, but a much more easy uh, solution would be to use licensing such as the type developed by Creative Commons uh, that uh, is commonly used now in, in the marketplace. So Creative Commons licensing. Uh, Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization that enables the sharing and use of uh, creativity and knowledge through legal tools. And it has an easy to use licensing system that's built on different components and it works alongside copyright. It doesn't take the place of copyright. Uh, everything by default when it's created is protected by copyright. But if you want to make your things available and adaptable, and be able to be repurposed, then uh, the Creative Commons license uh, would be a, a good solution to, to get your uh, content out in the OER world. 
And I am going to click on a video here, and I did test this with another uh, person when I'm sharing my screen, whether or not you can hear and see the, uh, the video, and it worked when we tried it, and so bear with me here, and if it doesn't work, we'll go a different direction, but hopefully um, you should be able to hear uh, the audio through my, my microphone here for this video. It's a short video describing the OER licensing. content legally? How do you let people know that you want them to reuse your own work? Creative Commons licenses can help you do both. We'll show you how. Our Is the audio coming through? Yes. Okay, great. World's exploded with digital opportunities. Now we can communicate, share, and work together using the exceptional distribution network that is the internet. Information and content can fly between us in exciting new ways. But it's important to know that when something is created, say a photo, a document, or a music track, it's automatically protected by copyright. Copyright enables people to say who can share and reuse their creations. You must always obtain someone's permission before sharing or reusing their work, even when it's posted online. But what if a creator wants everyone to use their work without the hassle of granting permission over and over? This is where Creative Commons can help. Creative Commons provides licensing tools that are free to use. You can apply a license to your work, which refines your copyright and streamlines how you give permission. Zach here downloads a photo called CC Kiwi that he wants to use in his science project. He can do this without asking Kerry, the photographer first, because she's already given permission with a Creative Commons license. Curry's license is legally robust, but easy for Zach to understand. She's told the world, including Zach, that they can use CC Kiwi as long as they acknowledge her as the original photographer. There are more rules Curry could have included. Creative Commons licenses are made up of license elements. You can think of them as rules, and each have their own special symbol. This is attribution. It means that Zach must acknowledge Kerry when he publishes his science project containing her photo. This is non-commercial. It means no one else but Kerry is permitted to make money from CC Kiwi. Tim wants to print the photo onto t-shirts and distribute them to friends. He can do this, but he must not sell them. This is no derivatives, and it means that Kerry hasn't given permission to change her photo. Kate can use CC Kiwi on her design blog, but will need to ask Curry before retouching or mixing up the image. And this is share alike. It means new creations that use CC Kiwi need to carry the same license. Jack incorporates his own remix of CC Kiwi in his video installation, but he must share the work under the same terms that Curry has. Each Creative Commons license gives permission to share and includes the attribution rule. So people who find your Creative Commons licensed work are automatically allowed to share it, but are required to acknowledge you if they do. The other three license elements are optional, and you can choose which ones to add, if any. Here are the six combinations that make up Creative Commons licenses. The difference between them is how many rules apply when someone wishes to use your work. The attribution license allows reusers the most freedom, and the attribution non-commercial no derivatives license allows the least freedom. The attribution license and the attribution share alike licenses are sometimes referred to as free cultural works approved licenses. These three licenses restrict commercial use of a work. And these two licenses do not give permission for adapting or remixing. These two licenses require new works to be licensed under the same terms. To choose and apply one of these licenses and to view their terms in more detail, visit us at creativecommons.org.nz. Or you can answer some questions to help you decide which license best suits your needs at creativecommons.org slash choose. There are some good ways to find other people's Creative Commons licensed work online.
you can use a search filter by going to the Creative Commons website. Why not try the Jamendo website for music, Flickr for images, or Digital NZ for New Zealand content? Using Creative Commons licenses could help your creations reach more people. Maybe you want to connect with others across the globe and take turns at improving a rapport. Or maybe you just want to have fun remixing someone else's work. Whatever reason you have to share your work, you'll find there are scientists, educators, companies, and public agencies who are using Creative Commons. By opening up permission, just imagine how much we can achieve. Collaborating on what we hold in common, being open about big decisions, and finding solutions in the spaces between us. Let's work together, confidently and legally. Okay, so what we saw on, on the short video was the, the different elements in, in the Creative Commons licenses. One deals with attribution, and you can see the, the little uh, icon for that. No derivative means you can't change it. Uh, share alike means that you can use it and adapt it, but when you share it, you have to share it with the same licensees license agreement that the, uh, the originator placed on the work. And then if you don't want it ever to be used for non-commercial or for commercial reasons, there's the non-commercial and you can mix and match the, the different icons to um, come up with the combination that you're interested in using for, for your work. And if you visit their site, you can easily copy and paste the, the different signs there that, uh, distinguish the different uh, terms of use. Questions, comments on, on the licensing? All right. And lots of places already use the, their Creative Commons methodology and uh, little icons. And you can see several of them here. And as I mentioned before, uh, if you use the advanced search feature in Google, getting there through settings, uh, there is a usage right pull down and it makes it very easy to understand what you're looking at as far as the licensing goes. So going into settings, we go to advanced settings, and then if you scroll down towards the bottom, uh, usage rights. So we free to use and share, uh, free to use and share even commercially, share and modify. So you can make the draw the parallels to the Creative Commons terminology and elements that we just looked at. So let's say I want to use something that I can share even commercially, and I'm gonna go and search for, Algebra One. Looking for resources related to Algebra One that I can use and share even commercially. And so, lots of hits come up, and if you go in, To the site, if you scroll down to the bottom or somewhere on the site, there should be uh, the lic licensing embedded in there. I don't see it on this one. Okay, this is First Lessons in Algebra as a resource. And you can see that she, all she wants is to be mentioned. Uh, and this is how you can um, stamp your work that you want to put out there in the uh, OER world. 
And there's lots of ways that you can put your creations out there. Um, it can be something as simple as Google Share uh, folder, or it can be something more sophisticated like OER Commons, which uh, has a much broader um, footprint than something like a personal website or a district website. All right. And this table just shows the difference between traditional copyright, uh, the Creative Commons layers that you can add to traditional copyright, and then distinguishing between public domain and, and free. And as we mentioned, uh, here's an example of how educators can collaborate and connect and add and adapt. Uh, so something as simple as the first person that created something can be used, as you can see, in a variety of ways uh, if it's out there and people can find it at, at a repository or through a search. And the uh, U.S. Department of Education has is getting behind uh, OER, and they have what's called a Go Open movement. And to date, I believe this shows 14 states and 40 districts. This I got off of their website uh, last week. But I was at South by Southwest. I attended a session, and there's more than 14 states and districts that are committed to Go Open. Uh, as of last summer, and this might have changed, uh, 19 states have committed to go open. And if a state commits to go open, th th these are the things that they commit to. Adopting a statewide technology strategy that includes OER, um, build a statewide repository solution for your open licensed resources in the state, um, publish OER to the learning registry, participate with other Go Open states in a community of practice, and make part of your uh, state website uh, a resource for OER. And then there's districts that commit within states to, to going o OER, or, or Go Open movement, and they uh, need to commit to identifying a team, commit to replacing at least one textbook with OER, document and share your process so other districts can learn from it. And there are what's known as ambassador districts, which have already gone through the process and they mentor other districts that are interested in that. This uh, chart um, was developed by Spider Learning and, and they do uh, training and, and support in, in OER and I think it's helpful for me as uh, someone who works in a regional service agency uh, and, and working with a school or a district that is thinking about uh, taking strides towards using OER in their programs in a significant way. These are things you need to think about. You identify quality resources, and these are some questions that uh, the folks building the course need to, need to think about. Uh, appropriateness, um, what content area do we want to start in, what technologies needed to access this, where will students access it, is it free, can I use it, um, when will students, in what format, what groups will students be in, and then how did, how did it go uh, after you uh, build it and, and implement it and students use it for a while, is it going well, or are we getting the results I need, and do we need to adapt it? This is another tool uh, that I, I find helpful uh, for districts and teachers to use. And I have a, co a copy of this file. It's too large to fit in a slide, so it's a PDF that's also out on the shared drive. But this is a way to think about uh, lesson plan for, for a particular topic. Identify the skill, have some steps of, of learning about the content, and here you can see it's based in intro one. The skill is given the graph or equation of a 
quadratic function identify the following parts. So there's the first free resource uh, is linked in the flow chart here. And what we're trying to accomplish is in the intro. Then a second piece of input uh, learning sequence for the students is in the next part of the flow chart. And here's a link to uh, go through the activity. A short assessment is given. And based on how well the student performed, there could be a remedial pathway that has additional resources, OER resources that have been planned out. Or if, if the student did well in that mini assessment, then you could have a path that leads towards a, an enrichment track. So again, not so much the, the particular content in this case, but just the, the graphically organize for a, a teacher what, what, what the learning sequence could look like and, and how you could deliver it to students, I think is helpful. And then this one has a, um, a way for students to self-assess, self-evaluate their mastery of, of what was attempted to be taught and what they were hoping to learn. Uh, SEPTA, the State Educational Technology Director Organization, has lots of resources to help find and vet quality instructional materials. If you can visit their site, you will come across this tool and other resources to help folks that are trying to build courses with OER. And then finally, the, the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education is the group that developed OER Commons. The Institute has been around since 2002. It's a well-funded think tank type organization based in the Silicon Valley. They've been behind OER efforts for a long time. And in, in um, I believe 2007, they um, launched OER Commons, which is a place, it's a platform that can be used simply to search for OER by keyword or by subject or by level or by standard. Um, it's also a place that um, school districts and states even can have hubs or groups. And this is where Pennsylvania has just um, decided to move forward and to purchase or become a member of OER Commons at the level where we can have our own hub for Pennsylvania, which will be available to you know anyone who comes on the site to, to look and search, but it's where Pennsylvania districts and uh, schools that want to build OER can build it and share it and um, have your own hub as, as a state. And so some handful types of organizations and groups that have hubs. OER, I think, was bigger in higher ed um, initially, and, and now it's it's certainly a, a major player in K-12, but so there are colleges that um, have hubs or groups, state university systems, and there's topical areas, and then types of groups that you can find here and build. It costs money to be part of a group, but you know, Hawaii Department of Education Science, Common ELA, Math. You can see other uh, organizations that have developed groups. And again, the connecting around the world, uh, certainly belonging to a a resource like a platform like OER Commons makes the uh, connection to others uh, a lot easier than doing it in a, in a smaller platform or format. And again, here you can either search topic by topical strategy or just type in a search term, much like we did at Google to find resources.
Hey, Brad. Um, we have, um, well, one question, one comment. Okay. Um, one first question from Beth is, when working with districts, is there a go-to resource or list of go-to resources that are recommended? And uh, Evan Abbey, uh, who's working with the um, with AESA's affinity group and open, also just clarified, he says, it does not cost money to be part of a group. It is free to participate if you even wanted to start your own group. But, um, um, but again, just comment, as I said, best question was if there's any go-to resources that are recommended. Okay. And, and Beth, where we are here in Montgomery County is we're, we're just identifying what's out there right now. So we would certainly not see ourselves as a, um, uh, we're, we're learning along the way as well. And we haven't really uh, formally offered any services to our districts yet. I think we're trying to gather steam as the Pennsylvania Association of Intermediate Units, 29 of us are uh, having this, this conversation and working with our instructional technology job alike group across the state as well as our curriculum folks and that core group is going to try and build services and resources that can help districts move along this pathway so we're, we're still a little green in this so I other than some of the links that I've shared uh, today I don't have any other recommendations and I, I know the Pennsylvania state Pennsylvania OER membership for the hub I believe does have a fee associated with it. So perhaps the groups are free. I, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of, of, of the differences there yet at this point, but uh, I know we have made a commitment in Pennsylvania to build our, build our own hub. And it might have something to do with access to the tools that you can build and, and share your uh, coursework courses, uh, with with the rest of the world, so we're we're learning as we go here as well. And the last slide that I have is uh, you know links to some other information about uh, some of the things that we've talked about. There's Go District Launch Packet. Um, Office of Ed Tech has some stories about OER implementation, and it's it's a uh, a service that we're building for uh, and we I'd say we're not offering much yet to our schools but we're just trying to gear up for it so that's where we are in, in Montgomery County thoughts from others and you, I'll, I'll take my share off and we can be back seeing each other um, go ahead Jeff I'll go ahead, Igor. Igor. I was going to say a few things about the OER uh, because a lot of people uh, consider that, well, you know, it's free, it's great, uh, you know, anybody can contribute, which is wonderful. But um, uh, things to consider, um, I, and I'm a big supporter of OER altogether. I think it's a, it's one of the greatest things that uh, that is happening. Um, uh, the one thing is the presentation of the content itself, the uniformity of it. If, um, if uh, teachers or, uh, let's say, if teachers start creating their own content and uh, you allow them to save that in a central repository, of course, uh, that content as it's being developed uh, is going to be uh, in all kinds of formats. Uh, it's going to be, um, basically, there's no uniformity to it. In many cases, it will be a combination of three or four different, uh, maybe more, resources that they grab from the internet, you know, pictures, uh, and so on and so forth. So the presentation, there is no one way uh, a person can look at it and experience it. You know, one thing, if it's a, like a supportive material for the teachers themselves, uh, the other thing, if it goes to the students, um, as a, uh, like a central uh, learning material, unless there is a uniformity in the content, it creates... Um, uh, a difficulty actually to learn um, and therefore uh, you know th that's kind of the drawback of this the other thing is uh, that uh, different uh, OER content can be very different uh, in a presentation itself so when uh, people uh, let's say if, if it comes from the same teacher into the classroom and there is uh, you know students open this uh, material and they see it you know in one way then this, they open the other material it looks completely different 
um, it takes human brain, of course, to adapt uh, to the ways they can process this. Um, so, um, the, the, and I can't stress this enough because the presentation of content is ultimately uh, what dictates whether the person will um, accept that or not. Uh, so ultimately, will, whether they will learn it or not. Um, so that's one piece that um, a lot of people mislook uh, when uh, looking at this. So the ideal implementation of OER, I mean, of course, there's uh, already uh, a lot of content out there that you can grab and say, this is a great tool. Let's just make it available to um, our districts. Um, the other thing is um, when you allow teachers to start creating content. So for that, I would recommend that, um, uh, you know, if you're looking at something like this, uh, or a possibility is to create a uniform way uh, by which the teachers can create a structure to the content that they're going to post. Um, and that will create all kinds of uh, money savings, time savings, and or uh, as well as uh, the uh, just general reception of the content uh, by the, the uh, audience uh, better. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, almost like course creator kind of tools that uh, uh, should be incorporated into this. Um, the, um, the other aspect of the OER, uh, of course, the, the question is, you know, what works best? So um, if you start uh, really like the Algebra 1, there is, uh, you know, free books, there is uh, all kinds of uh, commercial books available for Algebra 1. So wh what's the best? That's the question that I think anybody can ask. You know, is OER content truly really better than uh, other content? Um, in some uh, areas, you'll find that, uh, or for some kids, uh, for, some, for some teachers, it's, uh, this, this particular material may be better. For the others, the other material may be better. So it's very hard. Of course, it gives you the choices uh, to pick and choose from, which is wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, um, there is no uh, really one set an answer or to, to that very question, what, what is best? Uh, so just like any other content, it has to be truly measured uh, upon the, uh, well, what, what, what's the uh, performance? You know, how does it result uh, in, the, uh, in the learning outcome? You know, is it improving it or is it uh, maintaining the status quo? Or, or is, so those things over long term, they have to be weighted and measured. And the content itself uh, has to be um, uh, almost like uh, categorized for different groups or for different students, this particular content is best. For the others, the others should be best. So um, I believe that uh, the future of this whole endeavor is in analytics. Um, it's really tying the person, uh, personal preferences and learning curves to the content. So that uh, whether it's commercial or OER. ER. So th those are the things that they cannot be neglected or mislooked. Um, and the, the, so that's kind of my 10 cents into that. Yeah, I would agree with that, Igor, about the um, resources are, are really aren't what is causing success or achievement. It's, it's the instructional sequences and how they're used by the teacher or how they're developed in the course that really tell the story. And so I would be much more interested in, and I, and I agree with your point about the consistent delivery system. I think back 15 years ago when we first started giving every teacher a website or the capacity to build a website and we were all over the place and it took a while to come up with tools and systems to make it look like this you are in XYZ school district now and this is how you find things and, and get to places and we certainly need to think about that as uh, schools or a district starts from scratch to build OER. But I in, in my perfect world, I think about all these resources that are out there, and then I think about research on student achievement and the findings of, of John Hattie and, and his group with Visible Learning, and there's decades worth of research that show this particular um, instructional technique has much more impact on achievement than this one and their rank. So, building a consistent OER delivery system based on research of instructional sequences, instructional strategies that we know work, and those that 
there's considerable evidence don't work very well or you get much more bang for your buck if you have students do these things build in with a personalized learning concept of getting the student involved and within the structure and framework of rigorous standards but there's some element of choice based on interest and based on need that students have some ownership and aids with engagement and, and when the students engage they're much more likely to to put some effort into it and take responsibility for setting goals and then measuring their progress towards those goals and so my, my grand scheme of thinking incorporates all those things and I don't know what what it looks like yet but I, I think the tools are there the resources are there the cost is certainly manageable now it just takes people that can take all these pieces and put them together in meaningful ways uh, to address you know student need well let me share you uh, one thing that um uh, can help you at least uh, or, uh, open up the, the, the horizon of thinking on some of these things. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, I guess, the individuality. Uh, you know, and, and I, we as human beings are very different uh, in many ways, uh, one from another. And of course, we are uh, very much alike in many ways. Um, so, uh, with, with that being said, um, let's say you have 20 kids sitting in a classroom. Uh, of those 20 kids, there is no single type of resource, uh, no matter which research you will put in place, uh, that will say that this book fits all, okay? And the, the, the problem is, uh, not the problem really, but the, just the, the way the nature is, is that uh, different people have different uh, cognitive capabilities. So uh, some are visual learners, some are their, uh, you know, uh, learn be better by hearing uh, audio lectures and some other things. Um, and so there, there is actually uh, quite a few distinctive ways uh, people receive information. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, in order to absorb the information, you have to be uh, following different learning styles. Um, and uh, the, the problem of modern classroom is, is that every resource that's coming out there, they, they assume that all kids are the same. And so there's one magic bullet that will fit, uh, you know, um, uh, all of them, uh, and that, that's why you have some kids that do fail, and uh, the kids that don't fail, uh, and you, if you give two kids the same material, they'll learn it differently. Um, and, and the teachers also, uh, just like that, just like materials, uh, they, they sometimes fit better uh, you know, to the style of learning of one child, but they, they may not fit the other. Um, so with uh, with that being said, so what, what we're uh, and uh, we're th uh, I'm very thankful to Iowa AEs uh, for for kind of working with us on this project and uh, us, allowing us actually to work uh, on this project for them or so. <laughs> so um, the idea there is that um, and, and that's really applying the techniques uh, of the uh, what what are being used in the commercial world uh, more and more every day and in the scientific world. Uh, but um, haven't yet made into education uh, all the way yet. Uh, so those are the, the uh, applying the data, uh, s simply the usage of the, uh, the content and merging that uh, with the academic performance and looking at the history. So let's say uh, a certain type of students uh, read uh, certain material um, over and over, uh, you know, meaning that generation after generation, uh, of students, and we can find that certain groups are more responsive to this type of material, okay? Um, for, uh, while the others were more responsive and yielded better results from the other type of material. So what, the, uh, what needs to happen is the, uh, we, by using the big data or the analytics there, uh, we would be able to actually define what content fits better an individual. Not a group of people, not the entire school, not the entire district, but an individual. Uh, like for Johnny Smith, uh, it would be best if they learned through this material, while for, for another person, it would, you know, they, they could uh, use a different book that teaches the same thing ultimately, um, but they would learn better through that material. Um, in reality, that's, um, that's the way we are. I mean, that's the way the human nature. Um, all uh, the data can do is really help us to understand what fits who. 
And I would strongly encourage that uh, with OER implementation or any content implementation, some things like this to be considered, the personalization of content for individual needs. Um, the modern generation of kids, uh, what I find about uh, them is they're all about user experience. They're all about how do I experience things. Um, if it doesn't work uh, for them on the user experience, they'll go away from the product, they'll go away from service or what, whatever else. They just lean towards the other ways. Um, and uh, textbooks and um, video materials and some other things are just like that. I mean, they really have to fit. Uh, so if you really want to consider building something successful, I, I would encourage you to look at more personalization and uh, smarter systems that do understand the users that are looking at, um, at, at that content. Um, so. Okay. Beth, I think you had a question of, is there a state that is in the forefront with, with OER? Uh, you've heard what, what I was doing. Um, I can say that at, at South by Southwest, Oklahoma was part of the presentation on OER, members from their Department of Education, as well as Broken Arrow Public Schools was an example of a school district that um, has put some time and investment in, into to OER. So that would be another uh, state to possibly look at. Uh, one quick question we have here from Beth. Um, do you find that OER links go dark and are teachers using the initial content and editing to meet their needs or just using the content out of the box? Someone to what's done with the textbook. Well, in my experience at browsing through even things on um, OER Commons, the broken links, the black links are there as well as they are in, in other uh, tools and engines that you might have used over the course of your career. So yes, I mean, there, there is that issue with um, even with OER and even with the, the more sophisticated uh, platforms. And I, I haven't had enough experience to answer her second question to give some anything uh, relevant to that. Perhaps Igor has or someone else from the line? No, I, th I think you just summarize it very well. Uh, if, and it can be with the commercial vendors just, just as much. Um, you know, if, if they updated something and it just, the link gun dark, um, you'll have that. Uh, and it happens with the OER resources. It probably will happen a bit more with OER resources because uh, it's free, so it's, it's um, not driven by commercial need to host uh, those resources. So if somebody just decides to quit, you know, hosting, they, they'll, they'll right. quit hosting. Um, but but the, 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 once again, there will be two types of OER content that you will have. Uh, one will be self uh, or district created. So for that, you can actually have a, your own repository or you can have um, like commercial um, services, a lot of them are free, that will host that uh, content. So once it's saved there, it will stay there. Uh, and the other is just openly available on the internet kind of things that uh, you reference. So for those, of course, you're at mercy of whoever's hosting it. So. Okay, great. Well, we're coming up here upon uh, uh, four o'clock here. Um, any, anything you would like to add, Igor? Are there any questions from the group? The only thing I'd say is I, I, really, I enjoyed uh, Dr. Lind this, uh, Linda's uh, presentation. Uh, he's, uh, he's done a good job, so thank you. I actually found it very informative. Thank you. And uh, just one last quick comment. Um, the conversation doesn't have to stop uh, today at 4 o'clock. In fact, we hope it continues. Um, also, if you're not part, there's actually what's called an affinity group on open education resources and media that's being uh, facilitated through AESA, and I believe they also um, are having a, a virtual meeting tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure the time. I think Evan Abney's on here. If Evan can uh, uh, text me quick what the time is. If you don't know Evan, uh, he's at, um, I think he would have been in the email message. I also have his email address. 
as well. But again, NAMTEC and AESA is, are working closely together on these affinity groups and so forth. So again, begin to try and build that conversation and so forth. Um, and the affinity group is at 12 Eastern, 11 Central, 10 Mountain, and 9 Pacific. Um, so again, if you'd like to uh, um, uh, you know, continue this conversation uh, and be part of the affinity group of the AESA, uh, just send uh, Evan an email or send me an email. Um, uh, Dr. Landis's presentation, as well as the um, uh, this session, will actually is being archived, recorded. Uh, it'll actually appear in the Namtech YouTube channel uh, on the website. Um, uh, Dr. Landis, if you want, I mean, if if you could, if you can send me the PowerPoint, I'd be more than happy to uh, you know uh, to you know to forward that to the group as well. Sure, I I did uh, put a PDF version on the shared Google, the Namtech shared Google Drive. But if you'd rather have the the uh, the PowerPoint version, I'm happy to share that. Well, I I'll, I'll, I can get the PDF and send it out to, to okay. all participants. Okay. That that would be great. Okay. Um, are there anything else? Any other questions uh, for our panelists? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone. Thank, thank you, Brad, for taking time out of your busy schedule, and, uh, and Igor as well, and, and all of you uh, for being here for the shared conversation. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy the con I actually enjoy all these conversations, and uh, um, I do think it's an important topic that we're going to continue to learn and, and work more towards, uh, especially as we provide services to our schools. Um, again, uh, just a quick plug for the Leadership Summit. It'll be the week after Thanksgiving, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday in San Antonio Hill Country. Um, and that's uh, obviously a nice time to be in San Antonio if you're in the Northeast. Um, good. So, uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to say thank you for presenting, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. And let me ask you one quick uh, thing before we hang here. Can I get uh, Dr. Lindis's contact, if you don't mind? Uh, I'd like to just be in touch to see where you guys are going with um, the OER. And uh, if you ever have questions or kind of just experience exchange, and, you know, uh, I, I'd be more than happy to give you, you know, what, what we have experienced uh, and, you know, just, just share, share, share the knowledge in, in, in between us, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. And uh, Jeff, if you send the uh, the PDF out, the last page has uh, contact for uh, Jeff Rothenberger and myself, email and um, phone numbers. Okay, great. I will do that. Y yes, and Beth, um, I, I will. Um, uh, Jeff, maybe I'll I'll send you the contacts, and uh, you can send it to the group. Maybe that would be the best way to share my contacts. Sure. We're gonna keep it here. <laughs> All right. Okay. All righty. Um, and I guess with that, I'll, I'll get the